Welcome to Savvy Sab's podcast. I'm your host, Sabrina Salvati. My special guest tonight is Garland Nixon. He's a radio talk show host, a political analyst, and he's also the host of The Garland Nixon Show on YouTube. Welcome back, Garland. I know it's been a bit. Hey, thanks for inviting me. Always a pleasure. I love your show. I watch it all the time. Oh, thanks so much. How long do you think this this conflict between Russia and Ukraine is going to last? And I ask that because it does seem like things are escalating. Uh, Germany announced recently that they're sending in leopard tanks. This, of course, was after Joe Biden said that we would be sending in tanks from the U.S. So it just seems like it's escalating instead of de-escalating. And the big fear I think a lot of us have is the fact that Listen, Putin's not playing around like he says he has nuclear weapons. So how long do you think this conflict is going to continue? Do you think this may end up being like another Afghanistan? Because that's something else that I fear. OK, a couple of things going on here. Number one, as an example, the problem for I don't even say NATO because there's no it's the United States. NATO is nothing but an organization, an umbrella organization that the United States uses to bring all of its vassals in Europe together so we can put them all under one roof so we can take um, uh, uh, control, have control of their foreign policy. So there is no NATO as per se. It's the United States and a bunch of puppets doing what they're told. Right. And so a couple of things that most of their stuff is PR, number one. OK, Germany says we'll send tanks in maybe three months or four months. We're not sure. The U.S. says we'll send tanks. But now when you look at, into it, the U.S. says now the tanks aren't built yet. We can't send them the tanks. So the a, a example, the other day, the U.S. said we're going to send two more billion dollars worth of stuff. Right. Just the, three or four days ago. And when you read into the article, of the of it, one point seven billion dollars is to order stuff from the defense contractors to be built at a later time, understanding that there are other countries who have orders ahead of that. So after they get finished building the stuff for Pakistan and Egypt and Poland or whatever, then when there'll be no Ukraine left, of course, at that point. Then, uh, you know, uh, then that's when they'll build the stuff for uh, for for Ukraine. In other words, they most of the stuff, the PR stuff that they're saying, if you read, you don't even have to search, read the entire article from top to bottom. People look at the headlines. U.S. sending 30 tanks. and they, But if you read the entire article, it's yeah, we're ordering them from the general dynamics. And they said it could be a year. The Washington Post had a little had an article that literally said. The U.S. basically did that because Germany said we won't send tanks unless you send them. So we said that. And in the Washington Post, it said it could be months, could be years, maybe never. In other words, yeah, we just did that to get Germany. So you know what Germany's doing? Yeah, same with us. Maybe never. What are they going to send their tanks? They started off Ukraine had 2000 tanks. Now they got pretty much none because they all got blown up or another 30 or 40 tanks three to six months to a year from now going to make a difference. Certainly not. So you've got a PR war going on to fool the American people and fool the European people to think that we're providing all of this hardware and it's going to make a difference. And Ukraine is going to stand up and fight back. In reality, Ukraine, the Ukrainians are getting slaughtered and mm -hmm. the major towns in Ukraine are falling. And it's just a matter of time. The only thing about it is the Russians are kind of incremental acting slow. And if you look at the history of Russian warfare, what they did in World War II, they sit back, they throw artillery at you until you can't move. And once everything, there's nothing around but scraggly pieces of trees and boulders, they move on up and then they throw artillery at you until, you know what I mean? So they're just very slow and incremental. And that's what's going on. And the rest, meanwhile, they're doing that. And the West is just throwing PR and winning the Twitter war. And I keep saying, you know, if there's a war and one side's trying to win the Twitter war and the other side's using artillery, artillery's gonna win that battle every single time. And it's, so it's how long can they keep people believing that this is a fight and the valid Ukrainians are standing up against the Russians? They're gonna take Crimea next. They're gonna take mm -hmm. back the Donbass. Meanwhile, they're just getting slaughtered. Like, I mean, it's a really a, a crime against human humanity that the United States is just throwing the Ukrainians in front of artillery. And by a lot of estimations, they're losing like 200 people a day in just one town. 
Yeah, it's it's really bad. And I also wonder too, like I feel like they're trying to drag this war out. Um, I'm wondering how long do you think this is going to continue before somebody, uh, maybe on the Democratic Party side in Congress, stands up and say, look, enough is enough. We can't send the money anymore. Like, it's this, already this started. It's already started because um, there was a couple of articles um, that I was reviewing. There was an article in Politico. So what we see is the Rand Corporation, the Rand Corporation, which is funded by the Pentagon, um, wrote an article recently that said it's not good for the U.S. if this war goes on. So now we've got some neocons starting to say, you know, maybe this thing should end by summer. Here's the problem. Now, let me say this. Meanwhile, what did the Russians say? You read Russia, the, the, the TASS and you read the various Russian, you know, we're told don't read RT or TASS or any of the things the Russians write. And I'm like, why wouldn't you read that? Because you want to know what they're thinking, right? Mm. Here's what they said. Sergey Lavrov, the foreign minister, said within the last couple of days. They're talking about time. We have an objective. It has nothing to do with time. We will complete our objective. If it's done in a day, it's done in a day. If it takes a thousand years, it takes a thousand years. I'm, I'm adding that for effect, but you get my point. Their position is we have something we are going to do. Our objectives are clear and we are not putting a timestamp on it. That's for you guys to, to, to do. So the Russians aren't worried about how long it takes. They have an objective. That's what they're thinking about this. They've been in Syria since what, 2014? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, how long? I mean, you look at some of the various, what was it, Georgia, eight, nine years. I mean, for them, uh, uh, the Russians, I would argue, are slow to go to war. But when they go to war, they ain't in a rush. So if it takes a year, if it takes five years, Russia don't care. They have decided what they're going to do. They have changed their industry. They now have their industrial military capacity working seven days a week. 24 hours a day. They're building shells. They're building tanks. They're building everything. They have moved their economy to a semi-war footing so that if they need to continue this for the next 10 years, they have adjusted their economy. They have adjusted their industrial output so they can do it. They are prepared for however long they need to do it. We ain't. Because <laughs> we're running out of stuff to give Ukraine now. And our people are starting to say, you know, perhaps we should uh, start looking at a way out. And the Russians are like, that's up to you. Because we're going to finish this thing one way or the other. If you come to us and say you want a deal, we'll listen. But we don't have to have a deal because we have an objective and we're moving towards it. That's what the Russians are saying. Interesting. Um, one thing I, I want to mention as well, uh, you made a video and I, I thought this was this was really good because People need to see uh, how the money is being spent or where the money could go. Oh, sorry, Eric. I think I clicked on the wrong thing. I'm trying to go back to the other uh, tab screen. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, you you made this video. I think Eric's going to pull it up for me. It's the Twitter one. I saw it on Twitter. There we go. You made this video. We were talking about like the billions of dollars that has gone to Ukraine. And there was something that you mentioned here, and I think more people need to see this because this is just the reality of what we are facing here in the United States. So I just want to play this clip because I thought this was really spot on. This is the U.S. empire. This is, look at that, shanty towns. People live in these things. They find pieces of cardboard. Look at that, an old boat. This, look at the streets. This is the U.S. empire. This is the country. In this is the United States, these people live in this right now. Look at this. This is the country that we live in. This is the country that just is in, in the process of spending $858 billion on the military industrial complex right now. Look at the look at the street. The stores are closed everywhere. Just collapsed. Look on both sides of the streets. Business is closed. One of the things that exacerbated this was the lockdown. People couldn't work, they couldn't make a living. So the last three years has took a dramatic turn. This is the United States. What the hell are we doing? Sending um, all of this money to Ukraine. That's it, that's Oakland, California. Shack, shanty towns, garbage, a poverty. Look at that, that's America. That's what we got now. 
people have nothing. Is that uh, the great shining country on the hill? Old RVs that they build in there. People are living. Cars. People have cars. People drive that over there because they have jobs, but they don't have a house. Look at this place. This is uh, the United States. This is what we're looking at now. I think you've seen enough. You looked at those pictures. Is that a country that is going to collapse? Is that a country that may be collapsing? Or is that a country that has collapsed? It's Ukraine. It's a military outpost. That's what it is. Cold, hard reality. It's a military outpost. People can say it has about religion or ethnicity or this group, but we're giving billions to that military outpost while the country looks like this. That's the important piece, and we'll talk about Rage Against the War Machine in just a second, but that's the important piece I think a lot of people need to really see is that the homeless, the homelessness issue in this country, I've watched this increase year after year after year. Everybody has tent cities now, Garland. It, this used to be like a San Francisco thing, an LA thing, but they're in Austin, Texas now, which is one of the more cheaper places to live. They're in Dallas, Texas. They're in Raleigh, North Carolina. My dad was telling me there's more homeless people in Columbia, South Carolina now. We have them here in Boston. Like, how how long does this continue before the bubble really bursts? Because I feel like we're at that point where people are reaching their breaking point. Inflation is really high. But it's not just us. I, I talk to people in the UK. They're telling me their inflation is like 10.4%. This is ridiculous. So what do you think it's going to take for the American people to get thousands of people out in the streets the way that France has been doing recently to push back against this, this predatory system in this country? You know, I wish I had the answer to that because one of the things that we, you know, you saw that video. Right. And this is what America looks like now. I mean, just shanty towns, a third world country. And meanwhile, if you look on TV, there are a bunch of Congress members. And what are they saying? We have to push back against the Republicans because we lost our committee seats. Yep. And I'm like, your committee seats? People can't afford to eat. They're living in shanty towns. And these people are so detached from the electorate. You know, AOC, not just the, but the ones that are supposed to, oh, I'm there for the people. I'm a democratic socialist. And then there's Adam Schiff. Well, I expect him. He's a warmongering green neocon. But all of them, they're living in this little bubble where the biggest problem they have as they drive around in their Teslas and they have unlimited money coming in for $20,000 an hour speeches and things like that, their biggest problem is they lost their committee seat. Well, you know what? If you're sitting on a committee and that's the results, that you're, you're, you're losing a committee and those people, if there's a heavy rain, the top falls in on their house and they all get wet because they're living on cardboard. And- yep. So the reality, here's what I'm getting at. The people, the ruling elite in this country are completely detached and decoupled from the constituency, from the voters. And in in England right now, millions of people in the street. The, the, the fact of the matter is this. The people in charge don't really care. You know what I mean? They're like, yeah, the people are in the street. Oh, man, we better go get some tea. And what do you want to do after that? I said, we hang out and have a drink and dance some th or, or something, right? They don't care. So, you know, I think the collapse continues. I think unless people are willing to do something different voting, as long as people are just like every four years, you know, the two parties can scare them from of each other. Oh, my God, we got to do something. The Republicans are going to get us. Oh, no, we got to do something. The Democrats, the woke people are going to do something. And they're as long as they're able to scare us out of our wits using some cultural issue. We ain't going to do nothing. Every four years, we're going to vote for the same schmucks and we're going to keep getting there. They're going to whine about losing their committee seats. And then they're going to send one hundred and twenty billion dollars to their donors and we're going to get nothing. So the collapse is in the process. And if they don't care now, ain't nothing going to wake them up. The question is not what is going to happen to wake up the ruling elite class. They're already awake. The question is, are we going to do something differently than what we're doing now as an electorate other than just fight amongst each other and blame each other for our woes? Very well said. Very well said. Well, some people are trying to find a way to fight back, and you're one of them. There is a rally that is going to be happening in D.C. Now, this is February 19th, Rage Against the War Machine. It's an anti-war rally, 
And this is actually being hosted by a number of, of organizations. This is President's Day weekend. So for those of you that have President's Day off, if you're in the DC area, definitely check this out. Uh, but Garland, you are going to be one of the speakers. And I do want to show this. I noticed the list has has increased since I talked about this last wow. time. Yeah. So it's it's Jimmy Dore and right. Ron, Ron Paul. That's new. That wow. Cool. That is new. Um, He's going down here. Scott Horton. Dennis, oh, Kucinich. Dennis Kucinich. I used to see him at Fox all the time. You know, I used to be at Fox News. I used to see him all the time there. Wow. I had lunch with him and his wife one time at um in, on Capitol Hill. This is so that? different. Okay, so Andrew Napolitano. Uh, Napolitano. Oh, Chris Hedges. Chris Hedges now. Woo! <laughs> people are seeing my real reaction because last time it wasn't this many people. Uh, David Swanson, Daniel McAdams. Of course, there's Garland, Max Blumenthal, and Anya are mm -hmm. going to be uh, speakers as well. Uh, Supreme, for those who don't know, Supreme is a Wu-Tang Clan affiliate producer. I think he's one of the Wu-Tang Clan's uh, sons. I think, I think so. Wow. Um, Cash Tara rules Reed. everything around me. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Tara Reed, Diane Sayre is going to be there. Scott Ritter, Kim Iverson, Jackson Hinkle. Oh, Jackson Hinkle's done jumped in, huh? What do you know? I'm telling you, this list keeps growing. Uh, Craig, oh, who you guys know is Pasta from Convo Couch, yeah. Wyatt Reed. And I think that's all that's yeah, those are all the so ones far. right now. So yeah. far. Yeah. This is gonna be awesome. So I'll be there. I'm gonna live stream uh this event. I think this is probably gonna be one of the bigger, one of the bigger rallies that I've gone to uh politically anyway. Like the Assange rally, they said that was the biggest per uh turnout that they had um in DC, but that was a good turnout too. But I think based on what I've been hearing from people, I think this is gonna be one of the bigger ones. So, but Garland, why did you decide to join on? Well, you know, I think it's interesting. And let me add this. There's in there's things going on inside right now. And what, somebody who, I, and let me just say this, somebody who I think the world of, right? Think the world of dropped out today and said, no, there are people there who I disagree with, right? And so therefore I'm not going to be able to speak. And my reaction was, number one, I've never been to an event yet in my life where there wasn't people there that I disagreed with on something, never, you know, but the bottom line is this, my priority, you know, uh, you know, human extinction through nuclear, nuclear holocaust is kind of at the top of my priority list. So we may have disagreements in other areas, but we can't have disagreements if we're all dead. It's kind of like um, the, the Matrix where the guy says, says, was talking to Neo and he says he can't be the one if he's dead. We can't be, we can't fight for anything else if war takes us apart. And not only that, it, let's just say we don't get to that level. It's taken our country apart. We'll all be living in these stinking shacks and things of that nature. So what we have to do is prioritize. I think it is critical since we can't build a anti-war movement with just the left. So many people on that were once on the left now, they've re- um, uh, define the left. So, right. so many people that once were supposedly on the left are now, you know, they're diehard Democrats and warmongers cheering for war. We got to find out, you know, any port in a storm, as they say in the maritime uh, world. We got to find anybody we can. We got to build an anti-war coalition with people who prioritize pushing back against this warmongering machine that we find ourselves in. And if we have some disagreements, understand this. You and I, I guarantee you have disagreements. We could if we, we we could search around and find some things that we totally disagree with. That's fine. We're human beings. I look. I will think of something, and six months later, I'll look back and say, "Man, I sure was wrong on that one." So I think right. it's good, and I think it's powerful to start to bring people together based on a um, a, a set of priorities. Also, I think people should look at the demands. The demands right. are awesome. Look at the, go to that uh, because one of the de demands is. Free Julian Assange. That's right in there. People recognizing the importance of the First Amendment and the media. So the demands are very important. I mean, if you look over to those demands, they are fantastic. Stop the war inflation, right? I mean, that's for the average working class, working poor or poor person out there, right? Look at that. Nuclear de-escalation, disband NATO. What is NATO for? It is an Now they're saying NATO wants to go after China. North yep. Atlantic? 
but it's after China, that ain't nowhere near the North Atlantic. So there's things slash the Pentagon budget budget. How are we going to have do anything about homelessness without addressing the Pentagon's budget? So the things that everyone there has agreed on, you can argue these are for the betterment of us all. That's right. I, I, you know, I get tired of it too, Garland. People saying, well, I don't want to be a part of this event because someone that I don't like is going to be there. And I'm just like, no one is asking you to be best friends with these people. Like, <laughs> just like, you find want a friend, something. get a dog. <laughs> just find something that you agree with. Again, free Julian Assange. Like, I think all of us can at least, at least agree on that one. But I mean, like, there's too many purity tests and it's gotten to the point where, like, honestly, for me, it's just like, this is why things don't get done on the left. Because it's just I, I can't be with that person or I don't want to be seen with this person or they said this like a year ago. So I don't want to be at the same event. There's going to be a lot of people here. So I just I don't see the right doing this, Garland. I don't see them having these kind of like purity tests and they seem to be organizing on the ground. They're getting school board positions. And meanwhile, the left is just fractured. You know, one of the things that I think is an important discussion now, and that is who the heck is the left? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. The definition of the left. I will posit this argument. The United States in the U.S. politics has redefined the left. Right. Traditionally, what, what, what was the left? It was in the French Parliament. It was a literal physical metaphor. If you sat on the left side in the French Parliament, the people who literally sat on the left side of the room were the people who were opposed to the monarchy, were opposed to the status quo, were in a change, wanted to look out for the little guy. The people who literally sat on the right, right side, right, were the people who we're for the monarchy, the nobility, the class system, the status quo. That was left and right. Now in America, now traditionally, let's say in America, in Europe, what has left been over the last hundred years, right? The left was viewing politics through economic class, right? We got to look mm -hmm. at it through my politics or what not. Am I black or white, green, gray, or grizzly? It's Am I working class, working poor and poor? We have to the left. We got to look out for the working class, the working poor and poor. It has been redefined now. You'll hear people say, yeah, the left with all the woke or trans or whatever. Well, that ain't traditional left. Traditional left is, I'm not saying it's for or against it. I'm simply saying that I'm for or against it. Yeah, what happens to be for or against it? it? It is what it is. I'm saying to use cultural issues to define politics as left or right, as opposed to economic class, redefines it. So now you got Joe Biden, who is opposed to labor union, unions, that's traditional left, is in favor of um, concentrated corporate power, that's the opposite. Traditional left opposes and is very apprehensive about, right, is pro-war. I mean, all of the things that are traditional left, Joe Biden is in absolute opposition to him. He is for the status quo, quo and the new nobility. He would be sitting on the right side of the room. But now people say he's the left. Why? Because of cultural issues. So now in America... Yeah. When we say left, we mean cultural issues. We don't no longer mean economic class. We have to get that definition out and say, what the hell are you doing calling Joe Biden the left? And when you say that, people are like, oh, no, he's the left because whatever. And then you have some idiot saying things like, yeah, Joe Biden's a communist and China helped him. Venezuela helped. Him. He's trying to overthrow the governments of China and Venezuela. Really? They helped him? But it is a they bastardized people's understanding of ideology and politics to a, to a point where it has become farcical. And now Joe Biden's a socialist. Look, can I add something else to it that I think yeah. is important? This is a critical. Go to South America, which I have, travel around it. That's the left. Those people are socialists, Marxists, Leninists. They, they, we're socialists, no bones about that, right? Okay, but they're very economically, I mean, socially, and many times conservative. A lot of uh, South American countries are very Catholic, yeah. not much on abortion. The LGBTQ issue ain't all that hot. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. So they are, you're going to tell me a socialist ain't the left, but they are culturally a lot of diehard Catholics and they are culturally conservative. 
So they are the left, which goes to show the definition of the left is not about cultural issues because all of a sudden you'd say, well, all of these socialists in um, in Venezuela and Nicaragua and Cuba, all of these socialists, well, they're conservatives on the right. They're all Trump supporters here because of cultural issues. That just goes to show they are traditional left and they define their socialism. They define their leftiness based on the fact that they view the world through economic class.